Good evening. I hope that you are doing well this evening. We're going to be picking up in John chapter 5 in our study tonight of the gospel of belief. And we, this will serve really as an introduction to a new subsection in John as we're watching Jesus being presented. And we talked about how in chapter 2, verse 1 to the end of chapter 4, there is this inclusio with Cana of Galilee at the beginning and Cana of Galilee at the end. And Jesus is being revealed through many times in-depth conversations with Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman and his own mother even at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. And then, of course, there are smaller conversations and smaller conversions or conversations that take place along the way. Now, <clears throat> people are somewhat hesitant to receive him for who he fully is in Nicodemus and some of the disciples of John the Baptist. Of course, the Samaritan woman and the individuals in the Samaritan village were very welcoming to Jesus. And uh, that, of course, is to their credit. But they are the exception and in many ways putting to shame the Jews for their rejection of Jesus. And so what we're going to pick up with, this next section goes from chapters 5, 6, and 7. And in these chapters, we're seeing a shift from a hesitancy in chapters 2, 3, and 4 to the beginning stages of outright rejection of who Jesus is. And the incident that kind of sets all of this in motion that will cover the next three chapters is what we're going to study tonight. In John 5, 1 through 18 kind of serves as a launching pad as to where Jesus and the majority of the Jews, especially the religious leaders, kind of hit this fork in the road and they take it, they take the path to the left hand side of the road and they are going to reject Jesus instead of receiving him. And it's going to lead them, of course, when they get to the end of that destination, uh, on, as they travel that road, they're going to crucify Jesus and ultimately reject him throughout all the days of their life and then enter into an eternity without Christ, which is unfortunate. And so this all centers around this healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And uh, at this pool and this miracle that Jesus performs, it's quite peculiar because with this, you really to kind of get a good context of why this is so peculiar of a healing is to go and look in John chapter nine when he heals the blind man. And you see the differences in their responses. The man that he heals here at the pool of Bethesda seems to be now, we could be wrong, but he seems to be a very grumpy individual who doesn't seem to really uh, he certainly does not have the proper response to Christ's healing of him. He simply uses the healing of Christ to pass the buck on to Christ so that he doesn't get in trouble, but Jesus gets in trouble with the Jewish leaders. Whereas the blind man in John chapter nine was willing to take all of that and actually took on the Jewish leaders and came to faith in Christ in the process. And so there's something very peculiar about this man who was healed. It, it seems if obviously he's healed physically, but it seems spiritually he's got uh, he got a long road ahead of him. And so let's begin by looking at this account uh, tonight, John 5, 1 through 18. We're going to read the first nine verses together, and that will set the stage of the miracle, and then we'll look at the response that takes place to the miracle. So John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic or Hebrew called Bethesda which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up and take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now the day, now that day, was the Sabbath day. So, as we put this back in its context, now where we left off last week, Jesus heals the nobleman's son in Cana of Galilee. And so, the chapter 5 begins after this, after this healing, and it seems as if there is a significant, depending upon who you read, some individuals estimate a very significant amount of time between the events that we read at the end of chapter four and the events that we read in chapter five. Some people place a very large portion of the Galilean ministry of Jesus right here in this section. So after this, 
there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, a lot of discussion exists concerning this. We remember when we were uh, introducing the book of John, we talked about how John will have Jesus at a multitude of feast days. We've already seen it in chapter two when he went up to the Passover. We see it here in John chapter six. We're going to see him again at the Passover, John seven, John 10, and John 11. And so that's uh, at least six different times where he's mentioned of being at a particular feast of the Jews. Now, what's interesting about this particular feast is that we're not told which one it is. With many of the other ones, we're told what it is. We're told we're at the Feast of Dedication. We're told we're at the Feast of the Passover. This one is not given that, and some individuals have speculated that perhaps the reason we're not told which feast it is is because this work doesn't necessarily have a connection to the feast. I think that's a little bit overstated. Um, I think we're simply told that he was at a feast in order to place him at Jerusalem. I think sometimes we can read too much into the text. But there still remains debate about which feast this is, and there are possibilities. A very popular pop possibility that exists is that this is the Feast of Purim, or Purim. And uh, coming from Esther chapter 9, you remember when they are delivered from the Haman genocide that was to take place, that Haman plotted. And of course, the law of the Medes and the Persians couldn't be altered, and so the king could not actually rescind the order. He simply issued a new order that allowed the Jews to defend themselves when the individuals came to, ex to uh, exact genocide upon them. And of course, they were delivered that day. And so some people believe that this is that feast spoken of that was instituted in the book of Esther in remembrance of that. Others see it as him going to Jerusalem as uh, one of the three major feast days mentioned in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 16, when all male Jews are required to be in Jerusalem, which would have been the feast of Passover, the feast of the tabernacles and the feast of Pentecost uh, as they are used, especially in the new Testament. So which particular feast day we don't really know. Uh, other people, another, the other, probably the second most popular theory is that this is another Passover feast. But either way, it simply sets the stage to show us that whereas Jesus has been in Cana of Galilee, now he's back in Jerusalem, now he's back in Judea. So he says, as he introduces this narrative, now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool. Now a Sheep Gate was uh, on the northeastern corner of the city. And if you look in, in a lot of the backs of your Bibles, you will have maps that are there. And one of the maps that's usually included, it's not always included, but usually included, is a map of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. And there you can locate the Sheep Gate. And some of them will actually have maps of Jerusalem in the times previous to Jesus. And you can see, especially the Sheep Gate, because it's mentioned in Nehemiah 3 and verse 1. And Nehemiah 3 and verse 32, and again in chapter 12 and verse 39. And so <clears throat> he's setting this scene by the sheep gate, a pool. In Aramaic, this, cool, this pool is called Bethesda, or house of mercy. And so this pool, which has five roofed colonnades, or porches, okay, so you have the columns that uphold it, and then you have the structure overhead that they're upholding, and so it's kind of like a porch. Now, in these porches lay a multitude of invalids, blind and lame and paralyzed. And I remember this is, a, this is a time and day when you don't have major social programs that exist for those who have certain handicaps. And so they would gather together and they would beg in certain places. And this particular place they believed had some magical healing power to it. And so, of course, um, they're holding out hope that they can be one of the ones who are healed from this particular pool or spring that they will see. And so there are a lot of people that are in need in Jerusalem in this area. Then in verse 5, we're told that one man was there who had been an invalid for about four, 38 years. And so it seems like he's probably been paralyzed for roughly 38 years. Now, to what extent this paralysis, what is involved in this paralysis, we just don't know. Uh, there's just not enough evidence here for us. Is it something where 38 years is the entirety of his life? Or is it something that maybe he was crippled as a child? For an example, Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 9 was lame in his feet because when uh, the news came of his father's death, Jonathan's death, in 1 Samuel 31 is recorded there, that um, he was dropped and somehow became lame in his feet or was it some kind of an accident or even some have suggested based upon the conversation that will take place later that 
perhaps he had committed some sin that led to this paralysis. Um, but again, we're not absolutely certain. But what we do know is that we've got a man who has been paralyzed in some way for the last 38 years. And you can imagine how he feels in just being stuck in that position. So when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, of course, Jesus is omniscience. He knows everything. He asked him this question, do you want to be healed? Which I got to be honest with you, it's, it's kind of at first casual reading seems like a very strange question to ask. You look at a person who is been paralyzed for 38 years. They're camping out by a pool they believe has magical powers. And you ask him, do you want to be healed? It would seem like just sheer geography and history would tell you, yes, he wants to be healed. But this is the way of Jesus starting a conversation with this man. And this conversation is going to continue beyond just the physical healing. Jesus is going to talk to him about spiritual healing much later. And so he begins by this probing question. Very similar to the way you remember he started a conversation with the Samaritan woman uh, with a request saying, give me a drink. And so he uses different ways to introduce or to interject himself into conversations. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another one steps down before me. And so the idea was that this pool had this magical healing power. And the first person that went into the water would receive a miraculous type of a healing. Now, it says when the water is stirred up. Now, these pools were, were fed from the Solomon pools. Water would come in, but it also seems that they were, they were fed by an, a constant spring that was coming through that area. And so every so often, that spring would bubble up. And of course, you would see some stirrings in that pool, some natural stirrings. And from other historical documents, we learned that um, there were certain type of minerals that were in this pool and the water itself had an appearance of being red. And uh, again, I forget the exact technical term. I was never quite good at math and science. So, uh, but I forget the term, but it describes the red tint that was present. There was a certain mineral in the water that made it uh, appear red to those who were looking. And so he says, when I'm going, I've got no one to get me down into the water first. And so of course, someone always beats me there. So I'm kind of giving up hope. And you can almost sense a, 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 a hint of annoyance from this man explaining to Jesus, like just annoyed that he has to talk about this, just annoyed that he has to explain this to Jesus. I mean, shouldn't he know this already? Um, not that he believes he should miraculously know it, but he believes it's, in essence, he believes it's a, like a Captain Obvious question. And uh, so he seems somewhat dismissive in the way that he answers this question. So, Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. Now, your bed or your mat, as they would have been lying on, was made with straw and uh, probably had some kind of a cloth covering on it, obviously, to contain the straw that was in it, or that the straw was bound and then kind of shoved in this mat to hold it together. But anyway, <clears throat> he tells him to get up, take up your bed, and walk. And so what you see about the healing of Jesus, and of course, this, this is very similar, you remember, to Mark chapter 2, when the friends dig through the tiling in the roof and let their friend down, and he's told to rise and take up his bed and walk. I think Mark chapter 2 uh, and verse 11 is where that particular command is found. And so it says in verse 9, and at once the man was healed, he took up his bed, and he walked. Now, it's just matter of fact. He does exactly what Jesus did, what Jesus told him to do. Now, I've often wondered, when, when you think through this, um, you know, if a person is paralyzed, the, the process of, like, how do you go through the, these, the communication from your mind to your muscles that, where you have these voluntary muscles where you communicate to them that you want to perform an action, but this man has been paralyzed. And so even though these muscles are voluntary, you communicate to them with your mind that you want to move them in the past, that communication process, it might be communicated, but there's no ability to perform that task. And so I've often wondered what kind of goes on the inner workings of this miracle. How, is he surprised that all of a sudden this communication that he sends in his mind uh, to his legs to move that, that now they begin to finally obey his commands. 
which of course would be in obedience to the commands of Jesus. But he is healed, and he's not just partially healed. He's not just something that's going to take a long process. He begins some therapy. He's immediately healed. He gets up. Furthermore, he takes up his bed, which would not have been overly cumbersome to him, overly burdensome, but it's still a significant task to a person who's been paralyzed. And he just walks away. And so Jesus performs this miracle on this unsuspecting man who is actually quite grumpy in many ways, uh, in my estimation, when you look at this. Now, this incident is going to be a huge deal. It's actually going to be the incident, as we said, to where the Jews have been kind of, they're at this fork in the road. Which way are we going to go with this man, Jesus of Nazareth, that we've been investigating for quite some time? His popularity is growing. We're hesitant, certainly, and they're obviously leaning toward going away toward going away from Jesus to the left. But this is really going to begin that process where they make a decision to reject him on the whole. Now, this is why it all gets really ugly in a quick way. The last phrase of verse nine says this, now that day was the Sabbath. And of course, we're going to see this discussion come up again in the gospel accounts, the synoptics. It is a discussion quite often of Jesus doing things on the Sabbath, his disciples doing things on the Sabbath. And there's this constant tension about the Sabbath. So let's look at the remaining verses in our section and then we will try and unpack their meaning, including some background to the Sabbath to help us understand what's going on. Now that day was the Sabbath. So he called the Jews and said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, the man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had just been healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only did he break, not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So it seems when you look at these gospel accounts, Jesus will go out of his way to heal on the Sabbath, to do things that he knows are going to be controversial on the Sabbath. And there are multiple reasons why he's doing that, okay? First, and these are in, not in order of significance or importance, but first, it's to incite some confrontation. Not in the sense that Jesus is looking to pick a fight, but he's looking to cause them to examine their hearts and their preconceived notions about the Sabbath day because they have begun to worship the Sabbath. They have begun to misunderstand the Sabbath. Because in their mind, some of these Jews believed that if, if they could keep the Sabbath perf perfectly, it would usher in the Messianic age, and so they could earn that idea. For an example, a kind of a parallel thought when I was reading this was in the 19th century, the early 19th century, and even some centuries before that, but in the early 19th century, premillennialism wasn't the popular teaching. It was postmillennialism. And postmillennialism said that if we could create this place of peace, and, and this is what in many ways led the Puritans and other individuals fleeing religious persecution to come to America, they thought if they, they could bring the kingdom of God to earth, if they could create this nation that was wholly submissive to God, that if they could do things perfectly, that the kingdom of God would come to earth, that millennial reign that they, uh, in my judgment, misunderstood when it comes to Revelation chapter 20, that's not talking about a physical earthly millennial reign. That's a figurative discussion, whether it's, and so I, I, I don't agree with post-millennialism. I don't agree with premillennialism. Um, but anyway, the post believe that if we could do certain things, that we could bring, that we could bring the kingdom of God to earth. Alexander Campbell, who is famously associated with the churches of Christ, believed that. Um, 
And so the Jews had their own form of that. They believed they could usher in the Messianic age by keep the Sabbath right. And so they, they became obsessive about Sabbath laws and they codified their laws and they had 39 particular instances as to why it would be wrong, uh, specific examples of why it's wrong to work on the Sabbath. And, and what, is, what is meant by work on the Sabbath? Because when you look at the Old Testament, it's clear that the work on the Sabbath that is forbidden is this idea of commercial work, what I do for a living. You still had to feed your animals and do some of those things. But servile work, instead of stopping and focusing on God, you see, there are two occasions where we're told more specifics about why God gave the Sabbath. In Exodus chapter 20, when God gives the law at Sinai, he, the reason he gives for the Sabbath and, and resting on the Sabbath day is because God rested from his work in creation. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the repetition of the law to the second generation, there's another explanation given, and that is because God had redeemed them from the bondage of the house of Egypt. And so you have two ideas of creation and redemption. Both of them are simply the work of God. And so the Sabbath was meant to be a time, as Jesus will say in Mark 2, 27 and 28, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for the man. Okay? And you have gotten this backwards, is what Jesus is telling them. You're worshiping the Sabbath and misunderstanding why God gave it to man to begin with. You're acting like man is supposed to be a slave to the Sabbath. It's a gift from God. But you have turned it into something that is slavery. So, he's going to confront those ideas. Now, one of the reasons, one of the 39 categories, if you want to call them that, of work on the Sabbath, according to them, was carrying a heavy load or carrying a load, especially as it related to your work. Okay. So you can look at things with the, the giving of the law in Exodus 31, where, G, where God gives a pretty full explanation of the Sabbath law there. Uh, you can see it in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, you can also see it in other places uh, like Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 21 to 27. So, <clears throat> They have these ideas about the Sabbath. Now, the second reason Jesus does things on the Sabbath is for identification. Remember, the Sabbath was about whose work. The reason why man wasn't to work was because it was to focus on the work of God in creation and in redemption. So, when Jesus performs these miracles, he is showing himself to be God. He is working on the Sabbath because the Sabbath is about the work of God. And so Jesus is performing these miracles on the Sabbath. And so he is taking what has been corrupted in the original creation many times. And so, for an example here, a man who is paralyzed, something that God did not want to happen to individuals. It's not the way he intended the world when he created it. But it's a consequence of the fall. And so Jesus is restoring that. And it's telling us something about who Jesus is. He's redeeming that. And so he's identifying himself as God in the process. Now that's going to be where things go bad. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. You remember Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. So the man rises, takes up his bed and walk and a group of Jews see and say, hey, hey, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed and to walk. You're violating one of these 39 categories, which, by the way, if you look at their categories, he wasn't even violating. Because this was not a normal occupation. He didn't even have a job. He'd been paralyzed. But when you become, when you misunderstand the teaching of God and you begin to worship something that he has communicated instead of worshiping him, you get things badly out of order and you end up hurting a lot of people in the process as they did. I'm telling you how many people they hurt in their lives with their misunderstandings of the Sabbath. But he answered them and he said, the man who healed me, the man said to me, take up your bed and walk. He said, and so he's kind of taken aback saying, uh, uh, I mean, I'm just doing what I was told here. And, and so he, he could have, it seems like he assumed that Jesus was maybe part of, obviously, the religious elite at this moment. 
what, um, man, I'm just doing what he told me to do. I thought he was with you, maybe. So <clears throat> they asked him, who is this man that said you take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who'd been healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as the crowd was in the place. There was a crowd in the place. Of course, it's a feast day. There are going to be a lot of Jews in Jerusalem. So Jesus slips back into the crowd. Similar to what happened in John chapter 9. So <clears throat> he said, I, I, mean, I don't know who it was. And so he's fearing retribution. Now, verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more. Literally stop sinning that nothing worse may happen to you. And so Jesus comes to the man and says, look, you're well. And then he takes this physical healing and moves it to a spiritual healing and says, stop sinning so that nothing worse happens to you. Some people say, what could be worse than being paralyzed? And I, I in no way am downplaying those individuals who, who have paralysis. And Jesus is in no way downplaying it. I mean, why would he redeem people from it? Why would he reverse it? But one of the things we do have to understand is that there are worse things than some of the physical ailments that can come upon us. There are spiritual ailments. And that's what Jesus is saying. Stop sinning that nothing worse may happen to you. You think paralysis is bad. Wait until you meet your eternal destiny by cause of living a life of sin. You'll wish you could come back to this life and live with paralysis throughout all eternity. It's very similar to when the friends again lowered that paralytic down to Jesus. And he said to him, your sins are forgiven you. You see, in their mind, this man's greatest problem was that he was paralyzed. But Jesus reminded him, your greatest problem is that you've got sin in your life. Now, of course, he goes on to take care of the paralysis, but he uses it to help them understand that there's something greater than that. So, what does the man do? Instead of thanking Jesus, falling down, offering his worship and his gratitude for what Jesus has done, he goes and rats him out. Not that Jesus has done anything wrong, but he immediately goes and tells him, hey, hey, the man who went, <laughs> the man went the way and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. It's this, it's this Jesus guy. It's not my fault. You should be talking to him. Verse 16, then we see a more kind of a, a commentary on what's happened and what's going to, con to come as we follow it down throughout the text. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. He's jeopardizing the messianic kingdom, not realizing that he is the Messiah. But Jesus answered them, and the word answered in this text carries with it a, a flavor of a term that is legal in its nature, to give a legal technical defense. Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Now, what he's doing is attaching himself to the father. You see, rabbis had debated and had come to the understanding that, yes, God rested on creation, but that does not mean that he, he in that sense, stopped working because he's still holding all things together. Things consist because of him. And of course, in Colossians, Paul will explain that even further, that by the word of Jesus, all things consist or they are held together. And so they still understood that. And so when Jesus said, up until now, my father is working and I am working, he's making a connection between himself and the father by saying, yes, we work on the Sabbath because as God, you don't take days off, so to speak. Then we get this other explanation in verses 18 and, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Now, two things. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, okay, that was the first thing, which has really been what this discussion is about and what all of it's going to be about. But he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You see, when we communicate and uh, we say, 
as I was growing up and I would interact with people, whether uh, in town or in church or other places and would be visiting somewhere and they would hear my last name, which is, uh, I mean, it's not as peculiar as people think it is, but it is still somewhat peculiar. And uh, they would say, do you know Jimmy McNutt? Do you know Troy McNutt? And I would say, yes, that's my grandfather. It's my father. And so when I would say I'm the son or I'm the grandson of these individuals, it's understood that you've got the older generations before me and then me. And so that's the way we think of sons. So you have Jimmy, Troy is his son. I am Troy's son. Drew is my son. And so we're thinking about generations in that way. You have a big father and a little son. The Jewish thought of when you said you were the son of an individual was to put yourself on equal footing with that individual. So when Jesus said he is the son of God, he's making him, calling God his father, thus being his son, he's making himself equal with God. He's saying he is God, and he is. It's what this whole, what this whole book of John is about. But this is going to be a discussion that's going to be had in John 8, John 10. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be one of the accusations at his trial and crucifixion in John 19. Um, this is why this is where everything's going to change because Jesus's identity is becoming more public. He's challenging their understanding of the Sabbath, their their disproportionate view of the Sabbath, their misunderstanding of who he is. He's claiming and showing his identity to be Jesus, to be the Son of God, the Christ, the Anointed One that is to come. And so, with this incident. We're going to see now how things quickly begin to unravel, and this rejection of Jesus accelerates and turns into outright animosity. And so, as we think through this together, we'll pick up hopefully next week looking at uh, verses 19 through the end of this chapter where Jesus goes through and, and um, gives more explanation and solidifies and give, gives witnesses to the fact of his identity as God in the flesh. And of course, that will be the end of, of that particular chapter. Then we'll move into his comparisons with the manna. And then of course, at uh, the temple at another feast in John chapter seven, and his identity will continue to unfold and he will show how he's the fulfillment and the embodiment of everything the Bible has been speaking of before him. And yet individuals are going to continue to reject him. And uh, many of them are going to refuse to believe. And we are being called upon as readers to not fall into that same trap.